Most of you perhaps are not aware of it, but 37 years ago today, I had the privilege of speaking the first sermon that was ever preached in this congregation. There's only two of us here now that were part of that, but as I've remarked in the past, I don't think my faith would have been strong enough to have caused me to realize that we'd have come this far in that length of time. But it's been through God's power that all of this has taken place and through the work that's been done and the encouragement particularly received from the other two elders, this congregation has moved forward very well and uh, as Boone will tell you, we're very close to having our entire plant here paid off which is going to give us an opportunity to accomplish a great deal more. So I'm very much appreciative of each one of you who are here today and those of you who are visiting. We want you to know how much we're happy to have you here with us. Today I want to look at some little recognized facts about the resurrection of Christ. I'm not going to get particularly into the crucifixion itself because you're familiar with that story. You've heard it many times before. But the reality is that as we consider this and think about it, that you have the example set through the prophet Amos in the 8th chapter and the ninth verse, and it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun to go down at noon and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. We'll come back to that passage of scripture because that particular prophecy was made only 700 years before Christ. And one of the important things to recognize about the scriptures is the fact of how accurate they are in foretelling the future when we're dealing with prophecy. But as we look at these things and consider them, we need to also think about several things as we begin. One of the big arguments that's made by many in the world is that Jesus did not really die, that he actually well, just passed out and he came to in the tomb. Uh, we'll consider some facts about that, about the fact of how we know that he was actually dead, but uh, that's part of the story as we continue on. And I have a lot of ground to cover, so I need to, I need to move on fairly rapidly. When we, we look at this, in particular, in looking at Matthew 27, uh, we find that it was the about the ninth hour, or uh, that uh, the sixth hour originally, that he was placed on the cross, which would have been at noon time, and then it was about the ninth hour, around 3 p.m. in the afternoon, when he died. And your reference there in Matthew 20, uh, Luke 23 says, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. And what I've done basically is sort of parallel the scriptures here. We'll be jumping around because the story is not really told by all in its fullness by any one of the uh, gospels. You have to put all four gospels together in a a sort of a chronological sequence to get the real story. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 51 to 54, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had been had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many, so when the centurion and those who were with guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things <clears throat> that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly this was the Son of God. It's particularly important for us to note in this particular instance that we're speaking here about the things that took place at that particular moment, that the we have the... Uh, the, the sun being darkened over the whole land and the prophecy of Amos that we just read. In particular, the prophecy says that the whole earth, and this is in reality what the scriptures say, 
when you when you look at it and what's actually uh, told us is that and unlike the movies that you see and the various stories that are presented that where it was just a sort of a darkness that spread over the area where the cross was it was in reality a darkness of the entire world and that is something that you very seldom ever hear or ever are made aware of but the language that is involved when you look at it makes it completely clear that this is exactly what took place and I have the reference here and it's the one that's also in your bulletin but those of you that haven't seen it this is uh, what uh, the account that Pontius Pilate made and this is what he sent to the Emperor Tiberius in Rome and when he had been crucified there was darkness over the whole earth the sun having been completely hidden and the heavens appeared dark so that the stars appeared but had <clears throat> so but had at the same time their brightness darkened as I suppose your reverence is not ignorant of because in all the world they lighted lamps from the sixth hour in the evening and the moon being the, like blood did not shine the whole night and yet they this she happened to be at the full and of course the full moon was what was taking place at the time of, <clears throat> of the Passover so and the, the hours that are involved in this are also important in the fact that Jesus died his last or made his last breath and committed his, his spirit to God at the, the ninth hour or three o'clock in the afternoon. That is precisely the time and under the Passover lamb was to be killed and prepared for the Passover itself. So there's great significance in everything that took place there on that day because everything in it fit in perfectly with what God's plan was and of course as we said even Pontius Pilate was able to say that the whole earth had been darkened so much so that people had to light lamps because of the darkness and it's never very in fact I don't believe I've ever seen it portrayed in that particular way and it was the whole earth it was not just that one particular location. So it's important for us to be aware of these things and the events that took place at, at his death. And the fact that the, the veil of the temple, which by some is reported to have been a full hand width in thickness, was torn from the top to the bottom. And the earthquake that takes place at that particular moment also. And notice the way the scriptures present this, that the graves were opened it doesn't say that they were resurrected at that particular time, but graves were open and many of those that had passed on would appear, but it would take place after the resurrection of Jesus. So as we continue on looking at this and the reason for the fact that they were not raised before Jesus, from 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ was the first one raised from the dead. You say, well, how about some of the others that we've read about, some of the ones that Christ raised from the dead? The reality was that all of those that had been raised prior to Christ all died again. They did not continue to live. But when Christ was raised, he was the first fruits from the grave. He rose and he never died again. So those that came out of the tombs on the, the, uh, at the, after the resurrection of Christ, those that came out then didn't come out until Christ had been raised because they were going to die again. So Christ was the, the firstborn, you might say, from the grave in that particular standpoint. But then after Christ was, was raised and was, or was uh, actually when he was killed and when he was placed into the tomb, the centurion, of course, that saw him and those that regarded him had indicated that he was the Son of God. And <clears throat> you have the account given, of course, of how Nicodemus went to, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, rather, went to Pontius Pilate and requested that the body of Jesus be given to him so that he could bury him. And, of course, it, uh, that particular reference you have there doesn't show that it was Nicodemus included, the man that 
Jesus had had the, the conversation with in John the third chapter. But Nicodemus was also involved in this. And they took Jesus, of course, the body, and they took it and carried it to the tomb where they, they uh, placed him. The, and you have to forgive me, I have to sort my notes out here. This is from Matthew 27, uh, 57, 58. Now when evening had come, there was a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. Then the next day, after the day of preparation, and that was Friday, was the day of preparation for the Sabbath day, which was, of course was Saturday. So all the preparations for the Passover had to be made on Friday. And picking up in the kingdom, or continuing actually in Matthew 27, 62 to 66. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Of course, the, the Roman sent uh, soldiers that were sent for this purpose of guarding the tomb uh, I'm sure that they didn't understand particularly why this was done. And it's interesting also that the statement is made that, that the, the, this was a mistake that had been made previously. And I think what they're actually talking about here, and this of course is conjecture, but the, the chief priests that had been responsible for the death of Jesus, I think that they realized, and what this is telling us is that they realized that they had made a mistake by having Jesus crucified. Because one of the surest ways to, to ensure someone's continuing influence is to kill them and make a martyr out of them. And they believed that they made the mistake of, of doing that. And now they were in a situation where they said, now, if Jesus' body disappears, then this will just reinforce the fact that he was actually who he said he was. And we have made a mistake in doing what we did. So we need to ensure that the body does not disappear. So the best way to do that is to uh, send the Romans to do it because that way there will be no, no question about the fact that the tomb will be sealed and that no one will be able to get into it. And of course, when they seal the tomb, they normally use clay and they would have put bands across it and sealed them on the side with clay and then a signet would have been placed in the clay and it was a death offense to break those seals. So the guard was posted there at the tomb to ensure that, that no one would steal the body of Jesus. But then we get on to Mark 16. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. And then in Matthew 28, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Notice that there is a second earthquake. There was not just one earthquake, there were two. And perhaps this would be uh, looked at as an aftershock. But nevertheless, there was a second earthquake that took place, and that at the time that the stone was rolled away from the tomb. And some interesting ideas have come out of this, and as we go on and look at it, uh, <clears throat> you have the example of the, uh, uh, the women, of course, that have gotten to the tomb, and they are, are an angel sitting there on it, and in Luke 24, 3 through 8, and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining dark garments. Then they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? 
he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. This, of course, was after the time that the women had, had been uh, at the tomb, and they had encountered the Lord and had gone back to, to tell the apostles about what had taken place. But the apostles did not believe in the resurrection. That's the reason that it was the women that had gone to the tomb for the purpose of finishing the embalming process that was taking place. So now you have the stone rolled away from the tomb, so that now there is an access to the tomb. And another one of the, the interesting facts of this is that the, the stone was rolled away from the tomb in order to give access to those that were outside. Jesus did not have to have the stone rolled away so that he could leave the tomb. The, uh, and this is, a, I guess you would say, sort of a, a different way of, of looking at it and of thinking about it. But that's the, uh, the reality of, of the situation is that Jesus rose and came out of the tomb. And when they were looking in, when uh, Peter and John got to the tomb, of course, Peter went straight in and looked. And the, uh, I'll find my reference here in a minute. I got my, I got my notes just twisted around here. <clears throat> okay. In Matthew 28, 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice, so that they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And this is the time, of course, when the, the women had been to the tomb, the stone is rolled away, and the angel had spoken to them, and they are now going back to tell the men about it. And at this same time, when you put the scriptures in alignment, and the guards shook with fear and became like dead men, Apparently the guards were still there or in the process of leaving when the women arrived. Uh, and of course, uh, we've talked about this at other times that it would have been uh, the soldiers that were there, uh, these are professional soldiers. Uh, the 10th Legion was, uh, it was stationed there in Palestine to keep law and order. And these men had been, uh, had, had fought in a lot of campaigns, and they were true professionals. This was, this was not a conscript army. Uh, the Romans uh, very often uh, used people from the various countries that they had captured. They would bring their people in and, and cause them to take part in their military service, but the 10th Legion was different from that. It was, uh, you might say, it was sort of a home country uh, legion from the standpoint that these were these would have been would have been Italians that were made up this. Hence, as you recall from Cornelius, the centurion that was the first Gentile convert, he was a centurion from the Italian band, the Italian band in the in the that particular cent, uh, uh, group of Roman soldiers. So these men were not men that were unacquainted with what was going on, what was taking place uh, as far as military things were concerned. And they were fully aware of the fact that to desert their post would have been a death sentence. Uh, this is, of course, true in a lot of militaries today. If you desert your post in a, in a combat situation, which basically they were, uh, you could lose your life. But in this instance, uh, they are seen the resurrection of Christ, and they were like dead men. And I so strongly suspect that most anybody might have been that uh, if you saw someone that was, had been buried and a tomb that was sealed, and they came out of the tomb without, the, without even opening the tomb, he comes out. And of course, what gives us a, a real clue about what takes place is ultimately later, when Jesus appears to the apostles, in a sealed room where the door is closed and locked and Jesus appears in the room. So at this particular point in time, Jesus is able to pass through doors, he's been to whatever, without any problem. So we're dealing with a very different situation in the way in which you normally see it portrayed as if 
as if uh, he was just a, a physical body, though he did have the physical characteristics from the standpoint that Tom, he told Thomas to put your finger in the nail holes and put your hand in the, the, the spear hole on my side. But nevertheless, he still had this capability, which once again shows us just how, uh, how much he was, uh, uh, how different, I guess you would say, he really was from the things over there. In Matthew 28, 11 to 15, now while they were going, and this is the, <clears throat> behold, some of the guard came into the city, and the, the, while they were going is refer reference to the women. The women are going back to tell Peter and John and the other apostles, and went into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted them, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. And I know it was reported among the Jews until this day because while I was in the Air Force, I had a, a friend who was Jewish, and that's the same story he told me, that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, that uh, his body had been stolen. The, of course, the, the problems that arise with this is who rolled the stone away so the body could be stolen, particularly when there was a whole group of Roman soldiers estimated from six to 16 men that would have been stationed there. How would the stone have been rolled away and the body taken without them knowing it since they were stationed at the tomb? But uh, nevertheless, uh, if you've got to have some kind of an answer to what took place. And a number of different things uh, are interesting about the whole story. Jesus is probably, and I'm certain, the only individual that ever predicted that he would die and then be raised again in three days. And if you think about this, this would be a rather foolish statement for someone to make who did not have the power to do it. Because after three days, if the body disappeared, and, it, and all that would make it appear that it had happened, but suppose the body was found then this would indicate that everything that he had said, everything that he had taught was, was a lie. So consequently, the, the priest could not afford to have his body disappear, and if it disappeared, they had to try to find it. And the interesting thing again about this thing historically is there are three historians in this particular period of time, historically, that record the facts about the resurrection of Christ, and yet, there is no mention whatsoever of a body ever being found. There is nothing ever stated historically that the resurrection did not take place. None of the Jewish elders or any of them have ever stated or ever recorded, it was ever recorded in any of the Jewish literature, that Jesus did not rise from the dead. And so, the reality is that the resurrection took place in reading some of the material that is involved in this, there have been attempts on numerous occasions by uh, uh, I don't know how many different individuals to prove that the resurrection of Jesus did not happen. In every instance where that has been undertaken, it has resulted in basically the conversion of the individual who undertook to prove it was false. Because there is so much evidence to the fact that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And even uh, in one uh, well-accepted law professor who basically established what is used today as the laws of evidence in our courts, used the same approach to approach the death of Jesus and the information that was available about it, and came to the conclusion that even in a court of law today, it would be proven that Jesus actually rose from the dead. So. The only individuals that deny the resurrection today are ones who refuse to accept the evidence that's presented. They have their minds made up, it's the old story, I've got my mind made up, don't quote me the facts. So this is important though for us as Christians because Christianity rests totally upon the resurrection of Christ. If it were not for the resurrection, then it didn't take place. 
and Christianity would not exist. And yet it has gone on and has uh, <coughs> become, uh, I guess you would say, probably the most uh, powerful moving force that the world has ever seen. In John, the 20th chapter, verses 2 through 8, talking about when she came to Simon Peter and telling him, and Peter came to the tomb, beginning in verse 9, then Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came into the tomb went in also and saw and believed. The way this is expressed is that when Peter came in, he saw what would be called the shroud in which Jesus had been wrapped lying there. And the way it is used in the language means it was lying there as if Jesus was in it still. Jesus, when he rose, rose through what he was wrapped in and had left it right there. And another one of the traditions of that, if someone uh, rose up like that and had the covering on their face, the red linen wrap that was on the face, it was folded and put to one side. And so all of the evidence that Peter and John saw when they entered the tomb indicated that whoever was there had gotten up, had taken the wrap off of his face, folded it, and put it to one side. And of course, and then the, the statement here being made is, when John saw this, John believed. And that's an important fact too, because prior to that, they had not believed that Jesus was going to be raised. It was, it was news to them that Jesus rose. And of course, if you read through the Gospels, you see that that's precisely what. They had made no preparation for it. Then, of course, the, you have numerous examples, and part of the evidence about Jesus' resurrection is in like 1 Corinthians 15, uh, where he appeared to 500 at one time, and then there... There are roughly 10 different situations or examples given in the scriptures of where Jesus was seen after he was crucified. So a whole variety of different things took place. There was the earthquake, Jesus came out of the tomb. And after that, after he was raised, then those that had been, their bodies had been revealed as a result of the earthquake, then they came out and they were seen in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and certainly that would have been a surprise to everyone who had known them and had seen them pass away. But nevertheless, it went on and the stories of them were told, but the reality is, is that the resurrection of Christ has never been disproved. And in fact, all of the evidence shows that it is an absolute fact. And the reality, once again, as we think about things like this is, uh, there's as much evidence to the fact that, that uh, Jesus rose from the dead, as it is, for instance, to the existence of men like uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. None of us have ever seen him, but we believe him. We believe that he, they were. And all we've ever seen is pictures and whatnot, or paintings that have made, made of them. So when you stop and consider it, uh, the only way to deny Christianity being what it is and what God intended for, pretended, or intended for us to do is that it is a, a proven fact. So if you would put your confidence in a risen Lord who lives and is the only, the only religious leader that ever has come back from the dead and is still alive. So if you would put your faith in him today, we offer you the opportunity to make a confession of belief in him, to be immersed for the mission of your sins, or to <clears throat> ask the prayers of the church. You have that option. They offer you the opportunity to come while we stand and while we sing.